I recently heard someone quoted as saying something to the effect that if that guy doesn't watch his step, I'm going to go Old Testament on him. We can sort of relate to where that speaker is coming from because uh, we have an image of much of what happens in the Old Testament as being um, violent and vengeful and cruel. There are things that are done in the name of God, of, of Yahweh God, that we have a hard time wrapping our, our Jesus-focused understanding around because they just don't seem consistent with the ethic that Jesus taught and the way he lived his life. We see some language in the Psalms, either uh, the ones written by David or written by other people, that tie into that stereotype, that Old Testament stereotype of vengeance and violence and, and cruelty. The, uh, the Psalm writers use phrases like, break their teeth, smack them on the jaw. They say things like, repay them, destroy them, dash them against the rocks, break their arms, sweep them away, blow them away like smoke, eliminate them, confuse them, confound them, humiliate them, let death take them by surprise, take them down to the pit, trample them, wash your feet in their blood. This language is very difficult to reconcile with a Jesus ethic towards one's enemies. I grew up in Sunday school being steeped in language and ideas like love your enemy, pray for those who pursue you. If you are angry with your brother, you are subject to judgment just like the one who murders. So how do we deal with that tension, that, that Old Testament ethic, side by side with the Jesus ethic? In the Psalms, when we're reading the Psalms, it's important to remember that Psalms are art. They are an artistic expression, uh, an expression that comes from a human heart about what they are feeling and what they are experiencing and the effect that those experiences are having on them. We have to remember that when David wrote the words, smack them on the jaw, break their teeth, even though he knew that God had made promises and he trusted God to keep those promises, still he was just an angry, hurt human being who was waiting for God to come through on those promises, who could see the immediate effect that, that all of this, this fear and tension was having on the people he loved and for whom he was responsible for. And he included those phrases in his song to express those emotions. We have to remember that even though David, as much as anyone, understood that God claimed vengeance as his own right, God says, vengeance is mine, period. Even though David knew that and understood that, David's just honest human reflex is to want that vengeance to happen. He wants it to, to be brought to bear and he wants to use his music to demand of God the things that God has promised. David is living in the tension between his understanding of who God is and the promises that God has made and his own human desire. He's living between God's open hand and David's own clenched fist, trying to reconcile the two. And he does that through his music, through his lyrics, and through his songs. So how do we reconcile? Where do we live between the open hand of Jesus and the clenched fist of David. I think what we need to do moving, um, working our way through this psalm is we need to understand not only what David wrote, but what did he do? We need to ask ourselves, what did David do? Not just what did he say. When David regained control of the situation, when he got back on the throne, 
What choices did he make? What decisions did he pass down? What jaws did David strike? What teeth did David break? As we trace his return to the throne, trace his return to Jerusalem, the first one of David's enemies that we encounter is Shimei. You may remember Shimei was the one who, as David was running for his life, actually pursued David down the road, throwing rocks at him and calling him names. Shimei is the first person that David confronts as he is starting his return to Jerusalem. Shimei has the good sense to actually seek out David to make the long journey from Jerusalem across the Jordan River to where David is camped. And Shimei approaches David and he throws himself on the ground, confesses his wrong, and begs for David's mercy. And as Shimei is lying there on the ground, begging for mercy and waiting for David's decision, David starts calling him names and throwing rocks at him and humiliating him in front of thousands of people. Well, no, David does not. David hears Shimei. He receives his apology. He saves Shimei's life and lets him go. That's what David did. The next enemy that uh, David confronts in his return to the kingship is Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth, we were told, uh, had just sort of sat back and laughed from a distance as David, uh, David's life fell apart, saying, well, you're just getting what you're, what's coming to you. You're getting what you deserve. That's what we were told. But again, Mephibosheth makes that long journey from Jerusalem across the Jordan River to where David is. He throws himself on David's mercy. He tells David his side of the story. He lets David know that, well, maybe he hadn't been told all the facts and that maybe Mephibosheth wasn't quite as remiss as he had been portrayed. So David, on hearing this, says to Mephibosheth, well, you should have known better. You should have tried harder. You should have come sooner. Where have you been all this time? You should have. Well, no. David hears him out. He gives Mephibosheth the benefit of the doubt. He treats Mephibosheth as innocent until proved guilty. And he allows Mephibosheth to keep everything that his betrayal would have cost him. And he receives back everything that he would have forfeited in his failure. David lets him go. That's what David did. The next enemy that we look at um, in the story of David and Absalom is Ahithophel. Ahithophel was the one who was one of David's closest advisors, one of his trusted members of the inner circle. But as soon as Absalom started looking like a good bet, Ahithophel turned on David and abandoned him. When David learns about this, his actions against Ahithophel are limited to simply praying to God that he would be limited from doing any more harm. That rather than being an effective advisor for Absalom, he would be a poor advisor from Absalom. Just that Ahithophel would do no more harm. When Ahithophel realizes that Absalom is not going to come out on top, he goes home, he sets his affairs in order, and he commits suicide. Ahithophel, like Judas, did not give forgiveness a chance. He did not wait to find out what David would do. He did not wait for grace. The fourth, the final enemy that David has to deal with in all this is, of course, Absalom. 
his son who he loved, his son whom he had harmed, his son who became his greatest enemy, his son who struck out in ways that were simply wrong and who did harm to the people around him who were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. David, of course, orders that Absalom be brought to him, dead or alive. Well, no. David orders that Absalom be brought to him alive so that David could deal with him himself. No. David orders, not requests, but orders that Absalom be treated gently. And he adds, for my sake. Treat my enemy gently. For my sake. And we know, of course, that that's not how the story ends. That Absalom is intentionally killed after the battle is over. That when David hears about it, he mourns, he weeps, he locks himself alone in a room and he cries, Why, why couldn't I have died instead? And he stays there, mourning, until one of his soldiers comes to him and says, You have got to pull yourself together. Your people need you. Your people need their king. Your people need their shepherd. And David is able to walk away from his mourning for the sake of the people who need him. So, going Old Testament on somebody who wronged you. What does that mean exactly? Does it mean retribution? Does it mean destroying the person's reputation or, or, or undermining their influence or taking away something that they value that you think they don't deserve? Or assuming that we're not talking about a situation that is either emotionally or physically abusive or manipulative? Might it mean, as David did, letting your enemy come to meet you where you are, hearing them as they confess, receiving their apology, giving them the benefit of the doubt and allowing for the possibility that maybe they weren't guilty in the first place, asking God simply to keep them from doing any more harm to anyone else, might it mean just letting them go? Might it mean grieving the end of the relationship and pulling yourself together and moving on? Allowing God to break teeth. Allowing God to give them the chance to live without chewing you up from a distance. Allowing God to give you the chance to not be swallowed alive by grudges and bitterness and mistrust and the aftermath of revenge. I can lie down and sleep. I can wake again because Yahweh sustains me. I do not fear the arrows that fly against me on every side. Rise up, Yahweh. Save me, my God. Oh, that you would strike my enemies on the jaw, that you would break the teeth of the wicked. Oh, Yahweh, salvation. Oh, Yahweh, on your people. Blessing. Selah.